parent, volunteer, employee. With your different roles and busy schedule, how can you find time to complete the degree you once started? Cornerstone University's programs are designed for busy adults like you. Take one course at a time, back-to-back to move through your degree quickly. Attend through an on-campus, live stream, or 100% online format, whichever works best for you. If you're ready to go further in your goals, we're here to make it possible. Achieve without ceasing. Learn more at adults.cornerstone.edu. Now is the perfect time to work at Amazon. They are offering hourly jobs with great pay and even include a large sign-on bonus. No matter where you're at in the job market, you can select from a variety of available roles in your area. Join an exciting work environment and be part of a team that brings smiles to customers every day. To find the job that works for you and some extra cash, go to Amazon.com slash apply. That's Amazon.com slash apply. Amazon is proud to be an equal opportunity employer. Hello and welcome to the Sports Ethos DFS Today podcast. I am your host, Mike Patrio, joined by my good buddy, Harris Kermani. It's a wonderful Monday. We got five games to talk about. Nice little light slate, my man. But how are you doing, my friend? A good weekend? I know you said you got back into the cricket uh, cricket saddle after some time off. And you know, I guess that's probably not the right term to use. I mean, back on the saddle playing cricket. There, there That's the saying. But uh, feeling sore? Yeah, no, it's, uh, it was, I mean, we just got off our lockdown to be able to go back and actually have practices. So, you know, had our first club practice, got all super excited, had the whole, uh, have the whole facility to ourselves for about three, three and a half hours. And I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to take advantage of this. We have about 10, 15 people here. So let's go hard. I batted for an hour and now my back is telling me, no, no, my friend, that was not the right thing to do on the first, uh, first opportunity you got. So, uh, pulled it a little bit there and it's been, uh, it's been pretty bad for the last two days. It's been pretty much bedridden, but uh, has allowed me to binge a lot of things that I've been waiting on. So that's cool. Got to watch some basketball. Hopefully, I'll be okay. Good thing I work remote. Yeah. Well, let's just let's hope it doesn't turn into one of those Michael Porter Jr. back injuries. That's that, that's what we're avoiding here. But uh, so hey, you might come back from everything that we're reading and seeing. There's there's a chance when, the, when there's always a chance. But <laughs> uh, we got a nice little five gamer man. Before we jump into anything though, quick shout out to Thrive Fantasy guy. Come prop up over there with us this NBA season. Uh, with Thrive, you eliminate the countless hours of research and only focus on the top-tier athletes that have the biggest impact on the prop game. Choose 10 of 20 available player props. Build your lineup. Each prop is assigned a fancy value for both the over and under based on how likely it is to hit. Hit the most props, rack up the most points, and win your share of a prize pool. Thrive is over 50K in guaranteed prizes weekly for the NBA and has awarded over $6 million so far. So use the promo code ETHOS when you sign up. That is E-T-H-O-S. And you will receive 100% instant First deposit matching up to $100. Download Thrive in the App Store, Play Store, or visit their website at www.thrivefantasy.com. Sign up and prop today. We have your Toronto Raptors traveling to Charlotte, taking on the Hornets in the first game of the night. Uh, Get a good look at the injury report here. For Charlotte, it's Vernon Carey, it's Kai Jones, Scotty Lewis, Jalen McDaniels, JT Thor all rolled out. Uh, and then for the Raptors, it is the usual suspects in Goran Dragic. Uh, everybody else should be good to go. And Goran's probably going to be one of those guys that ends up getting moved. And I have a feeling it's going to be to my Mavericks, man. Uh, I just, I've been saying it all season. I'm surprised it hasn't happened yet, but the writing's on the wall. 225 and a half game total. It's a pick 'em. So they're expecting a tight one here. I'll let you start with the Toronto Gary Trance. <laughs> yeah, Toronto and Charlotte is always one of those matchups that uh, has been fun as far as the Raptors are concerned. And uh, it's also been a couple of heartbreaks. So it's a Jeremy Lamb game winner. Kemba Walker used to hit game winners on us with that. So it's just uh, been a banana skin matchup for us that we never like. But what it is, is fast paced. And at 223, uh, we, how many game totals do we have for today? Have we got uh, right upper? now we have. Yeah, I can tell you right now we have. All five of them. So oh, this wow, is okay. coming in as the second highest right now. Fair. Yeah, and as I said, at that mid-220 range in a game that's going to be one to two points either way, it's going to be one of those games. You know the Raptors are going to go deep with their starters, and that's where it comes down to. Fred Van Vliet at his price tag is exactly where I'm looking to start it off. Uh, 8500 is just too cheap, well, first of all, for what he's been playing for the last 
seven games now. He hasn't had a game below 40 DK points for, uh, count it, one, two, three, eight games now. So it's just uh, an absolute smash price tag for him to be able to come into a matchup where Charlotte, as great as they are offensively, are not going to do anything on the defensive end there. So I expect him to have yet another big game against them uh, as he's had the previous years. Hasn't actually played them this year so far, but we'll uh, be in a good spot to be able to get him to hit easily his 5X, I feel. And I'm, I'm going to stick with it, man. Gary Trent at 6,300. It's just the starters are all the ones. If if Scotty Barnes was at the same price as Gary Trent, I would go with Scotty Barnes. But Scotty being 600 more expensive on there, I'm still okay with uh, going with any of those guys at the starting lineup that are 7K and below. And I wouldn't even fault you with for taking uh, Siakam, given how he's been playing as of late. But I just feel like this is one matchup you could probably have a little bit more exposure to, just given how everything else is, is working out. But... I mean, we have a couple of other games on the slate that I have, uh, especially a couple of forwards that I'm interested in. So I probably will avoid Siakam on here. But uh, between Van Vliet and Gary Trent, I could see myself having a good bit of exposure. Boucher had a good game against them last time around, but you know how he is hot and cold. His minutes are also all over the place, but he has had two great games in a row. So from a G- GPP standpoint, uh, he could be a good pivot for you to look into as well. But that's probably the major guys I'm looking at here. I honestly, I'm kind of right there with you. I don't, I don't mind any one of these starters. I mean, we talk about it all the time going against Houston or going against Charlotte. Everybody gets a major, major bump. It's that simple. And you know, I know you said you're probably not going to end up with too, too much Siakam. I probably will. Um, I know you said there's a lot of forwards, but looking at just the power forward eligibility of these guys, if I'm spending up on anyone, it's probably going to be him. I prefer him over Randall. I prefer him over Butler and the Rosen. Um, it's just that simple for me. So just by product and necessity based on lineups, I like him. I always play Freddie Van Fleet. There's no doubt about it. He's always the guy that I'm looking at, whether it's you know this matchup, any other matchup. He's got that safe floor because of the assist. He always has the, the upside due to being like their second leading shot maker or taker next to Siakam, sometimes first, depending on which way you want to look at that. I know you're going to say Gary Trent. Um, I know. It's okay. Uh, but he actually, he's the one guy that didn't play in this matchup earlier in the season. So he was out that day. Uh, we're seeing a lot of, I wouldn't say inflated numbers for these other guys because it's a fantastic matchup. But I just want to like proceed with caution with getting too, too much exposure. I think two guys, uh, depending on which ones you're spending up on, makes a whole lot of sense. And I'm probably only going to spend up on one of Van Vliet or Siak and probably pair it with one of those other guys in that 6K range if I'm doing anything. Now, I'm kind of, I'm kind of the Gary Trent hater, I think, at this point. And you know that. I do think this is a good spot for him. Um, I'm probably not going to end up with too many shares of him just because just because but i wouldn't it wouldn't shock me if he has a nice little bounce back game here but for the most part i'll be looking at siakam van vliet and then i wouldn't fault you if you wanted to take one of these wings but it's almost a toss-up when you look at og and scotty on a night-to-night basis uh it really depends on whether their shots are falling because neither one of them's garner all that high of a usage if i was probably going to go anywhere i'd probably go scotty just because he's 400 dollars cheaper but to each his own and i'm not looking at anybody coming off of the bench so probably end up with most of the spend ups on the other side of the ball though uh, definitely some some solid options, but with everybody healthy, it's kind of a little bit of a mismatch all over the place. Now, I had some shares of Gordon Hayward against Miami. Ask me how that worked out. You probably already know it didn't go well. Mm, yeah. uh, but it's a, it was a salary that that had me intrigued. It was at fifty nine hundred. Now he's all the way down to five k. At five k, man, it's hard for me not to want to take stabs at them. They're going against a tough defense. We know that the utility and the usefulness and the length and everything else of these guys being able to switch with Scotty and OG on the wings. But at five k. You don't need much. And if he's playing 30 minutes, I imagine he's going to be able to probably pay that off pretty, pretty comfortably, Um, at least give you a nice base floor. So I definitely have some interest in Gordon Hayward just by necessity on that price tag. Don't think this is the exact LaMelo ball type of situation I want to target. He is under that 10K price tag. I'm ignoring these down games over the past few. Like that, that means nothing to me. We know this dude's upside. He's a walking triple double. So it was one of those situations where I wouldn't fault you if you wanted to play him. I just don't see myself having too many shares of him. I think I'd rather just spend up on Siakam on the other side of the ball. Uh, makes sense if you want to run it back with two powerhouses. You can easily do that. But I think you know, getting some of the exposure to some of these other cheaper options, like Gordon Hayward, uh, and maybe even I kind of like this matchup for Bridges as well. So if you want to look at Bridges in this one, I wouldn't fault you either. But I think Gordon Hayward's going to be my top target I'm looking at on this team. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. That's exactly the guy I've been looking at too. And it's probably going to be, my favorite uh, mid-tier place to be able to go at 
just one his price tag two just is a great bounce back candidate to be able to come back in this kind of a game uh, he's got that little bit of extra length at the wing that helps them get that shot making going so i expect him to have a little bit more usage than he's been seeing in the last couple of games and obviously he's coming back from uh, his layoff as well with the covid protocols and i mean three of 20 for the last two games is obviously not what you expect from gordon hayward who's been quite solid this entire season so i expect him to be in a pretty good spot uh, you spoke about bridges absolutely uh, Lamelo is always in play for me, but as you said, I'll probably be looking more at Van Vliet on that side, save a little bit of money to get a couple more mid-tier guys that I'm interested in here. But if I'm looking at exposure on this side, I probably am interested in uh, in Miles Bridges. One, he didn't have an amazing game the last time they went and hadn't played, but it was also, he shot it pretty well. It was just the ancillary stats that weren't uh, coming out there. And, and in general, he's been uh, you know, getting back into the groove as far as uh, getting those rebounds and assists back up to where we expect them to be. So this is probably one matchup where I'd be looking at him to get himself back into uh, that groove of being able to get around 40 DK points. So he's uh, definitely in my player pool for me, but Hayward's going to be the major guy for the position eligibility and for that price tag. All right, we'll move on to the next game. We have the wonderful Miami Heat traveling to Washington, taking on the Wizards here for the Heat. Jimmy Butler, Tyler Hero, Caleb Martin are all questionable. Uh, we know Markeith Morris is in danger of missing the rest of the season. Casey Akpala, Victor Oladipo both rolled out. Max Struss is questionable as well. Uh, and then for the Wizards, Bradley Beal remains out. Daniel Gafford is in the health and safety protocols. This game looks like it is coming in at a, let's check this out, 214 game total. Miami being favored by three and a half. I'll pass it over to you. Talk about the Heat. Yeah, and for the Heat, it's the, the questionable tags that I'm going to be taking a look at because if uh, Jimmy Butler and or Tyler Hero end up taking a seat, then Kyle Lowry definitely becomes a, a big guy to be able to play for me. 6600 is an excellent price tag for him to uh, get himself back into the groove. Uh, he did pretty well in the last game, 31 minutes, uh, and didn't get his shots up in the same way. That's where you'll be able to see that increase as far as usage, usage is concerned if uh, Hero or Butler do sit out. And then the other side, Bam. Bam in general has been a guy that I've been targeting heavily for the last couple of uh, couple of slates now, and obviously he's been working out. He looks completely rejuvenated. He got all the way up to 21 shot attempts in the last game, even though he didn't shoot all that well. And uh, you know, it was a blowout win for them, so it didn't help or hurt them all that much. But Bam at 9,000, we're talking about all these uh, price-up points that are out there. Honestly, he's probably my favorite uh, price-up guy outside of Fred Van Vliet for that 8,500, but... We, as we will be looking at some of these 10K guys later on, I'm actually not all that interested in them. I do think this Miami-Washington game will be relatively close on a on a home game for Washington. They've been pesky in that situation. And Bam uh, going up against a couple of Washington centers that are either coming back from injuries or just straight up not able to hang with them are going to be uh, absolute food for him to eat and get his uh, price tag or pay off his price tag pretty easily. Yeah, so I'm right there with you, though. It, it's going to depend on who's playing. I mean, Butler has been pretty much playing through this toe injury, toe soreness, uh, whatever it may be. He's not giving the Aaron Rodgers treatment where uh, after each game he's talking about it. So we don't we, we don't know exactly what's going on with that. But uh, you could tell it's definitely been bothering him and limiting him. I mean, he shot well in that last one, and the game ended up getting out of hand. So he only ended up playing 29 minutes. The game prior to that game got out of hand only 25. So I imagine if the game stays close, he's going to be able to suit up uh, and play full allotment so i'm not worried about it necessarily you know, lingering or bothering him i mean the guy's been shooting well either way now if the game does start to get out of hand though then he's gonna be the first guy that comes off the floor if he plays though at nine seven not the best price tag for him but i do like him in this matchup he'd probably be the guy i the other guy i'd want to spend up on if we see him playing but you don't need to play him because i think you could play kyle lowry there at 66 regardless of the situation whether butler plays or where the brother sits uh, obviously, if Butler sits, he's going to get higher usage, more ball handling responsibilities, more shot attempts. Everything else goes up, and we're, we're going to have interest. I'm probably going to be off the Tyler Hero on this one. I don't mind Bam. Uh, I know at the end of the day, I'm not going to be able to play three guys at 9K. It's probably just not going to be able to be feasible for me. But if all three of these wing sits, or if one of these wings sits, or whatever the situation is, because we're talking about Butler, we're talking about Struss, we're talking about Caleb, we're talking about Hero. They'll be running very thin on the wings. And if that's the case, I think Duncan Robinson at 3,600 immediately comes into play for me. Uh, just a rock solid value. Obviously, we know we're relying on his three point shot and his scoring ability. But if he's going to be playing 30 plus minutes, he could very easily get you 20 to 30 DK points. And at 3,600, it's a pretty solid value. He's averaging 22 DK points against this team in three matchups already. Uh, and in those matchups, he's only played 27 minutes. So he's the other guy that I think is probably in play no matter what. If, as long as one of those guys sits, I'd have interest. And I imagine that all four of them don't end up suiting up. And then I think no matter what, we can look at Lowry 
And then your picker poison between Butler and Bam. If Butler plays, obviously, I think he's in play. If he doesn't, bigger boom for Bam. Uh, on the Washington side of the ball, as long as we know that Bradley Beal's out, we know that the usage is probably just going to be spread around a little bit between Kyle Kuzma, Spencer Dinwiddie, Quintavis, Caldwell Pope will get some extra shot attempts. Uh, everybody gets a little boost. Now, this is a pretty pretty rough matchup for everybody in general. Uh, you never want to target teams necessarily going against Miami. They play at a slower pace. They have great defense all around. Now, that obviously changes if we see some of these guys sit. So you're really going to have to kind of wait and see. But I do like the price tag on a guy like Spencer Dinwiddie. Uh, I don't mind Kyle Kuzma, but I don't usually like to target him in, this, in these types of matchup. But if with no Beal, if you land on him, I wouldn't fault you there. He has the upside. He's been giving us a rock-solid floor for the most part outside of that last game where he's been putting up routine 40-point games. And he's just a little too cheap. He's just not as viable for cash. He's definitely like a GPP target because we've seen him put up 24 and we've seen him put up 50. So it can really fall anywhere in between there, and it wouldn't shock me one bit. And I really don't mind looking at a guy like Thomas Bryant. I know the minutes are going to be limited, but if he's playing 20 minutes, they're going to need his size. I don't know how much they'll be able to get away with Montrezl Harrell going against Bam necessarily, but no Gafford. Uh, if this guy's able to play the minutes, I know they've been working him back kind of slowly. But the highest we've seen him play so far is 22. But if you think he can get to that 25-minute mark, that's a fantastic price tag for him. Even at 22, he can pay that off. So all in all, long-winded conversation right there. Don't mind looking at Dinwiddie. And even Harrell, I don't mind. I don't mind either one of these centers. Uh, Harrell's the safer guy. You're looking at Bryant to be a little riskier. Uh, but that's probably it. Those three guys are going to be the main guys I'm targeting. And, and then Kuzma, and I guess, in some tournament plays. At Walgreens, we know February is the season for L-O-V-E. It's also something sweet for your sweetheart season. Or my favorite, wait, that's today's season? Or the just found out my kid has a crush season. Good luck, Mom. This Valentine's Day, Walgreens makes it easy to quickly get last-minute gifts with pickup in as little as 30 minutes. Because if it's Cupid season, it's Walgreens season. Right now, select fragrances are 20% off. Offer valid through 226 while supplies last. Restrictions apply. See Walgreens.com for details. Yeah, I'm pretty much right there with you. I think the only thing I'd potentially add is uh, if I'm looking down at the bargain side, Aaron Holiday is going to continue to get the opportunity to start with uh, Bradley Beal still out. Got 22 minutes in the last game. Uh, shot it pretty well. It's uh, just a matter of usage for him. But at uh, 3,100, he's got a pretty good spot to be able to get to that uh, you know 20 plus DK points mark. It's probably more of a GPP play as well. But uh, just having that capability to have a starting guard at that bargain basement price, I'm okay with going with that. All right, third game, Phoenix Suns traveling to Chicago, taking on the Bulls. The Bulls look like uh, they are in the second half of a back-to-back, so no injury report for them. For the Suns, the regular guys, Frank Kaminsky, Abdul Nader, Campaign, Dario Saric, Landry Schmidt, all ruled out. This game has the highest game total, 228. Phoenix favored by six and a half points. I will pass it over to you, my friend. The Phoenix Suns, who are you looking at? Yeah, with the Phoenix Suns, you pretty much know what you're going to get on a night in night out basis. The real upside to me is always looking at uh, the DeAndre Ayton side of things at 7,200. I think that's a fantastic price tag for him in a matchup where he's going to be needed to be more involved against Vucevic on the other side, coming off an excellent game against Washington in which only 24 minutes he absolutely feasted. So it's just been kind of him getting back in the groove in the last three games that he's gotten back from his, uh, from his protocols slash injury. I forgot what he was out for, but regardless, he was out for about uh, 15 days there and hasn't passed the 28 minute mark yet, but there's no sort of uh, restriction per se on him. It's just not been required for him to be able to go that hard on it. So I am looking at him to, uh, be able to get in a pretty good matchup over here. I think Chris Paul and Devin Booker are very fairly priced for what they are. Uh, you don't really have that much upside, but if you do get a close game, then you know Chris Paul in general gets his usage turned up, especially in the fourth quarter. His assist numbers are always going to be great there. So we talk about rock solid floors. There's very few floors that are more rock solid than Chris Paul. And the fact that he's had uh, like out of his last eight games, four of them have been 50 and above, including two 60 point games. I think he's absolutely in play in any game that can stay close and requires him to play in the fourth quarter. So definitely someone to think about if you're uh, trying to not take, let's say, Lamelo or Fred Van Vliet, one of those guys, then perhaps you want to go ahead and get Chris Paul in there as well. Yeah, I think it really, for me, this this entire game and the whole Phoenix side comes down to your game script. Now, this game does have the highest game total. But for some reason, I just find myself shying away from it. Uh, just because I think everybody's pretty much priced appropriately. I'm not getting a ton of value. But if you're playing some heavy bodies, oh, it's almost like that that Charlotte-Toronto game. If you're playing some heavy bodies like a Vooch or a DeRozan, then it makes sense to maybe run it back with somebody with some upside, whether it's an Aiton, uh, Paul, or Booker, one of those three. But for the most part, I'm really not that interested in any of the three. Uh, just think that, like I said, 
you know, I don't mind paying the 7,200 from Aiton, but I need to know I'm getting 30 minutes out of them. I, I can't trust Aiton to go out there and put up a monster game like he did against Washington in 24 minutes now. Much better matchup going against Washington than it is Chicago. Vooch has actually been holding his own on defense over the past few games. Uh, you, you know, even that game today, he went against B. There's nothing you could do there. B's going to cook you. Uh, you know, there's no doubt about that. Uh, but for the most part, over the past like four or five games and a little bit of softer matchups, I guess you could say, uh, he's been holding his own fairly well. So I just don't see myself landing on too, too much over here on Phoenix all in all. Um, they're all kind of just pivot plays for me, uh, especially the spend up guys. The one guy I could see myself maybe getting a share of is Jay Crowder. And he's again, if I land on him, I don't mind it because I know he's got a you know, decent enough ceiling at that 25 to 30 DK point mark. And the floor is usually 18 to 22. So I never mind landing on him, but I'm not going out of my way to play him either. Uh, on the Chicago side of the ball, it's pretty much everything I just said about Phoenix. It's, I think everybody's priced appropriately uh, from playing somebody big on that other side and like multi GPP lineups. Then sure, why not? But I really don't want to pay the 9800 for DeRozan. I don't want to pay the 10 one uh, of Vooch. I mean, it's going to be a tough matchup. You know, probably we're going to see a good amount of bridges handling DeRozan. We know what he can do. He's put Steph in a blender for a few games. I know he's coming off of a monster game that he had today, 45, 9, and 7. Uh, it's also a back-to-back, so it's like all these guys, it just doesn't feel like the thing I really want to do. If there's one guy I could look at, it's a guy just like in that Jay Crowder situation, Javante Green, where we know he's going to play some decent minutes. He's got a decent enough floor. The ceiling's probably right around 30 DK points, and he's priced right around that low four range where I could feel comfortable playing a little bit of Javante Green, but he's probably really the only guy that I have a ton of interest in. Yeah, I'm, as I went through this uh, slate, first of all, Javante Green was the main guy that I ended up checking off for Chicago right off the bat. If Zach Levine is again out, that just adds to a little bit more usage for him. We've seen his shots go somewhere close into the double digits when, when Levine is out, so that only adds a little bit more to his upside. But beyond that, as you said, he's gotten all the minutes, and DeRozan is great as he was today, and man, he was awesome. I don't know why he's listed as power forward. That just doesn't make any sense to me either. It's just a very weird position to put DeMar in. But yeah, 9800 is just not the kind of price tag you want to pay for him. That's pretty much at his... That's, that's his upside most games. He, today, he had an an outsized performance where he had to just pretty much go off, but it's just not, uh, not the place you want to look at for consistent value. Yep. And this next game is probably going to be less exciting. Golden state warriors traveling to the tanking Oklahoma city thunder. Uh, it's all, it's OKC tank season right now, but for the warriors, uh, B. Jalika, Draymond green, both ruled out as well as Wiseman Otto Porter jr. Andre Goodala are both questionable for the thunder Dort is questionable. He missed that last one. Uh, due to tanking reasons, they said it's a nasal fracture. Uh, and then Shea's out, Mike Muscala's out, JRE, Jeremiah Robinson Earl's out, Isaiah Roby, Aaron Wiggins, all of them are ruled out as well. This game is coming in at a 212 and a half game total. Golden State being favored by 12 points. I will pass it over to you to talk about the Warriors. Yeah, and of all the games I looked at this late, this was the one. Honestly, outside of Kuminga on the on the Warrior side, I have very little interest with any of these guys over here. I just don't trust them enough to be able to go ahead and get the minutes that I'd need for them to do it. I expect this to be a blowout pretty early. Curry at 10-5. I mean, he's always in play. May go off for three quarters and go ahead and get that for you. But honestly, at that point, I expect Van Vliet or even a Lamelo or even a Chris Paul to have a greater raw points total than Steph Curry in this matchup. So I'm avoiding him altogether. Uh, Clay Thompson is the other place of interest he had an excellent game in the last one but again it's his minutes that uh, end up kind of working out one way or the other we know he can play up to about 27 minutes which is more than enough for him to be able to pay off his 6300 salary it just all comes down to how uh, the game itself ends up working out so he's probably in play for me in gpp i probably avo- avoid him otherwise uh, just you know, there's more upside to be able to get, or sorry, more solid floors to be able to get for someone at the 6,000 range. And as I said, Kaminga, regardless of how the game ends up going, I expect him to get into that 26 to 29 minute range that he's gotten in the last few games, has been getting double digit shot attempts. It's just one, one of those situations where you know, the Warriors are getting themselves set for a playoff run. They want to be able to get as much of their roster set, as much of their rotation set, and have these guys be in good form. Uh, Kaminga is going to be important for them. He's obviously one for the future, and he's getting the minutes now. So I'm very excited to take him at 4,600. Yep, I'm right there with you. He's the only guy I really have any interest in, just because obviously it would be a little bit more helpful if we knew that Otto Porter was sitting. 
Uh, I don't expect Iguodala to play in this game. We we know that he's been kind of working his way back a little bit as well. But without a Porter sitting, he'll probably most likely either draw the start or play significant minutes off the bench. Game gets out of hand. He's still going to see good minutes no matter what. Uh, on the Thunder side of the ball, there's definitely some value plays that we could take a look at. I don't think I'll be spending up on Giddy in this matchup. Um, even Baisley's probably not a guy I'm crazy interested in. But taking stabs at guys like Trey Mann, Tyre Jerome, or Diakite, uh, those are the three guys that I'd have the most interest in. And I would even fault you if you look at that Pakovsky. But it, it's obviously some risk that's going to be associated with Pakovsky. He played his first game in just about a month. Uh, in that last one, he ended up playing 26 minutes and, you know, I could see him easily getting extra run in a blowout. So I think basically all those guys are in play for blowouts. I think the guys I end up with the most shares of would probably be like Ty Jerome and Pakovsky. But that's pretty much if I'm just assuming this game gets out of hand. Jerome drew the start in the last one regardless. They're just running out of wings right now. They're very thin on the wing where I think no matter what the game gets out of hand or not, they're going to have to need these role players to play significant minutes for them just to finish out the game. So those are the main targets I have in my mind, but you tell me if I missed out on anybody that you're that you're interested in. No, I think you pretty much hit them. I know you, uh, in passing, talked about Diakite. I think he's going to be important for OKC, uh, especially with uh, Robinson Earl out for probably, I'm going to guess, they're saying six weeks. could be much longer than that. They have no reason to go ahead and get him back. So he's starting at center by default. Uh, his minutes have been around that 24 range. Uh, he got 30 in the game prior to that. So if he can get somewhere close to... You know, anywhere in between that, he's a great uh, setter to be able to go ahead and take for 3700 Totally happy to do that. And then um, Darius Baisley, I, I know you spoke about not being super excited to take him, but I just think they need they need that offense, plain and simple. Someone's got to be able to shoot the ball, and even though Giddy has been you know, getting his shots up to a greater extent in the last two games, his price tag now has kind of put that uh, upside to a little bit lower there. I think Baisley has the same kind of shot buffet going to be coming to his side as well, so... Yeah, 5,400, I don't think you can go wrong with that. And you know, power forward's not really the most exciting spot to uh, be able to take guys tonight, unless you're going up big with Siakam earlier on, or maybe a Randall later, but I'd rather spend my money up elsewhere. And if I can save a little bit to get uh, a little bit of upside with Basley, why not? All right, we'll move on to the final game of the night. New York Knicks traveling to Utah, taking on the Jazz here. For the injury report in New York, it's just Derek Rose. And then for the Jazz, Jordan Clarkson, Rudy Gay are both questionable. Rudy Gobert and Joe Ingles are ruled out. This game looks like it's coming in at a 213.5 game total. Utah is being favored by 7.5 points. Uh, talk to me about the Knicks. Do you think Randall could have that repeat performance? That was, again, an overtime game against his former team. Uh, we know that the Lakers' defense in general is pretty putrid, but, I mean, the Jazz haven't been much better without Rudy. So is he a guy that you're targeting, or are you going to go chasing R.J. Barrett? Because I think if anyone listens to this podcast, they know I don't do that. I, I, <laughs> I, never, I will not. Yeah, no, R.J., I'll probably end up on him just a couple because it's hard to ignore what he's been doing in his price tag kind of stays in that same range. But Randall, I just think is in a good price tag. Uh, that overtime game. Yes, it went to overtime, but honestly, the Knicks didn't do anything in overtime. It didn't really add much to his DK points. He pretty much was at that 66 even before the game got to there. So not too, too worried about that. I do think this is a pretty decent uh, spot for him to be uh, getting the kind of usage. I mean, Utah's not the most uh, speedy team or any of that, especially uh, at this moment. But with Gobert out, you're going to get more opportunities for him to you know, go up against either Hassan Whiteside or if they're going with Azubuki again as the starter. It's just a matchup that uh, Randall can see if he can play a little bit of bully ball, get himself, get himself in there, see if he can get Whiteside into foul trouble. I expect the usage to be super high for him as it always is. So he's definitely on my player on my player tiers. And we were talking about Siakam earlier at that 9200 and Randall 88. I know you said you prefer Siakam, but honestly, I'd probably prefer Randall uh, given that his usage is likely to be higher in a matchup where he's cheaper and you know, he's got a similar kind of floor, a little bit more of an upside just because he just loves to chuck the ball. I mean, I hate Randall as an actual player, but from a fantasy perspective, I, uh, I enjoy targeting him in most situations. So I'll probably end up with a little bit of him. And uh, just outside of that, looking down again, Alec Burks, 4,800, 30 minutes last game. And as I've said, the Thibodeau, any opportunity he'll get to be able to play Alec Burks more, he likes the, what he brings on the defensive end. It's not you know, the sexiest pick to be able to make, but at 4,800, I think his minutes total, by and large, is pretty secure. Kemba just sucks. <laughs> There's no two ways about it, and he's always going to be a massive liability on the defensive end. So that's one spot that I'll be looking at just from a small forward eligibility as well. 
It's also a little narrative going against the team that drafted him. Yeah. Uh, he was a Utah guy when he first came into the league. So I'm, 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 I'm I don't hate Randall at all. I, I, you know, I started off saying this as though just to kind of get your take on it. I had to build it up a little bit, but I do like Randall. Um, I just think that product of necessity, like you said, if I'm playing lineups that have Fred Van Vliet as my top spend up on Toronto, then it makes sense to pair it with a Randall rather than get double exposure to both those Toronto guys because then I feel like I need to spend up on a Bridges or Lamelo, And then before I know it, I don't have as much cash left to maybe get you know shares in this game or shares in that Washington-Miami game. Uh, so I just don't see myself, you know, fading him completely. That's not going to happen. And listen, if Butler sits, I very well will have a lineup that will probably have Randall and Siakam both in there. Uh, it just makes sense to do that for me. And then also I'll probably get to another guy on the other side of the ball that we'll talk about as well. But I do like Randall and I do like Burke. So those are the two guys I'm looking at uh, as well. I wouldn't mind it if you want to go to a Mitchell Robinson pivot at 5,200, but I just don't think it's, he's not a guy I play very often. Um, Trying to pinpoint when these games are going to be good and when these games are going to be bad. I mean, he never has high usage or anything like that, but he's hit double digit rebounds in four out of the past five games. The blocks and steals, they're pretty much always there for him. Now, I don't expect him to get eight like he did against Memphis, but keep in mind, he's not going against Rudy Gobert. It's going to be Hassan Whiteside who takes bad shots himself and isn't really afraid to shoot a lot. So this could be one of those games where we see a little bit more of that higher block upside. So those are the three guys I kept in my player pool, but I probably see myself landing on two uh, and not as much of Mitchell Robinson when it's all said and done. And then on the Utah side of the ball, Donovan Mitchell, 8,400. Only played 21 or 22 minutes in that first game back, but it was also a blowout. He looked fine, though. Shot 8 of 10 from the floor. Had six dimes, three boards. Put up 42 DK points in only 22 minutes. Uh, Yeah, sign me up. I'm good with Mitchell Robinson. He's probably my favorite spend up on the slate. Uh, I'm definitely going to have a good amount of shares of him. It's definitely going to be one of my key cogs to build around. That's just way too cheap for the usage that this guy's going to have. Definitely all over that. And then I don't mind looking at Whiteside at 6K as well. Just knowing that, you know, played 24 minutes in that last one, put up almost 30 DK points. That was his first game back uh, in about five days off. And they're going to need a size going against the front court with Randall, with Mitchell Robinson, Nerlens Noel coming off the bench. I can see this being like a 28-minute night for him in which he could put about 35 DK points pretty comfortably knowing his upside. So those are the two main guys I am targeting. And if we happen to see like Clarkson or one of you know Clarkson's ruled out, it's just going to be more usage, more or less, for guys like Bogdanovich and Middle, Mitchell. Conley doesn't really absorb a whole lot of usage when anybody sits out. Uh, but 6,600 feels priced appropriately. I don't think we're getting too much value out of that. So, again, Mitchell, Whiteside, two main guys I'm looking at. I have a feeling you're going to mention Royce O'Neal, though. I don't know why. Something's telling me you're going to say Royce O'Neal. No, not Royce O'Neal. I was going to say if Clarkson is ruled out, I'm going back to Trent Forrest. I've been taking him in the last two games. Uh, I've had solid games in both of those. Obviously, the first one was with Donovan Mitchell out, but even in the last one, he was able to get 28 minutes. So, you know, that Joe Ingles uh, time is going somewhere, and it seems to be going a lot towards Trent Forrest. And, you know, he's actually, I was going to say, he's my favorite value play to be able to go ahead and uh, take in this lineup. And then, as a bookie as well, it's just he's starting. He's got 24 minutes in uh, each of the last two games. Again, just solid floor, 24.5 in pretty much both the games that he's got there. So, again, not the sexiest pick that's out there. But given that I'm trying to look into probably two to three of that 8,000 to 9,000 range rather than going for the 10, I'll probably have to round that with some of these value plays at the end. And I'm finding I'm landing on one or both of these guys in a couple of these lineups. The only thing that worries me a little bit about Forrest was also that he got 28 minutes in that last one, but it was also a complete blowout. So now if Mitchell ends up playing like, you know, the 30 or 34 minutes, uh, do those minutes come from Forrest? That, so that's the only concern I have with Forrest. Um, and then we might even see Azubuki's minutes get limited a little bit more if they end up increasing white sides again as he's working his way back. So I think they're both in play as rock solid value. So I'm not going to rule them out, but I can't go into the slate with immediate confidence as guys that I feel like are must play value plays. But I'm not going to sit here and argue with you because their minutes have been solid and they have been secure. It's just one of those things I'm keeping in the thought in the back of my mind that, you know, don't be shocked if they end up going back down to, you know, if Azubuki's playing eight, nine, 10, 12 minutes, whatever it might be. And then Forrest is back down to like 17 to 20. Uh, neither one of those things would really, you know, shock me. So I'm, I'm keeping my eye on it and I don't mind them. But guys, I just as of right now, my initial build, I don't have either one of them in. That brings us home, though, man. That's our player tier segment. Let's jump into it. Your expensive spend up yeah and i think there's a couple of solid options over here but in the end i think fred van vliet at 8500 just happens to be the most rock solid of all of those plays Uh, he's got all the upside to be able to drop 50 plus on any given night he's in a matchup that's if not the highest the second highest total on the night as well i think everything's in play for him to be able to have an excellent point total just plain and simple steady freddy he's been an all-star and uh, he's going to show exactly why before he gets into it 
I like it. I will go with Donovan Mitchell at 8,400. I just spoke on him, so we already know how I feel about him. But like you said, there's was, there was plenty of guys that we could. And I'm, I'm glad we're both on the same approach. Stay away from 10K guys. Try to lock and load if you could get three of these 8 to 9K guys. Uh, I think is the best way to do it. And now your mid-tier play between 5 and 7, 9. Yeah, and I think right on 5K, we talked about uh, Gordon Hayward having you know, a couple of mediocre games coming back. Uh, his minutes total is still kind of getting back into it, but at 5K, there's just too much upside for him not to be worth taking into this kind of a matchup. Uh, you know, Everything else is in play. He just needs to shoot a little bit better. 3 of 20 in the last two games. I expect him to right that ship in this one. A little disappointed in you. <laughs> a little disappointed. <laughs> I didn't want to. If I threw Gary Trent, that'd be a little too much bait. And you know what? Uh, Hayward just made more sense to go out there. Well, I mean, honestly, those are the only two guys in in that mid tier range I was even looking at were were, were Trent Jr. and uh, and Gordon Hayward. Uh, and now I feel like I'm I'm almost forced to say Gary yes. Trent Jr.'s name. I feel like <laughs> maybe that I was almost, my plan. I, I think it was because I almost just want to cheat and go with like Alec Burks at 48, but that's kind of against the rules. Uh, but yeah, I really don't love the mid tier all that much. I mean, I just don't see myself going to too much. So I guess by necessity, I'll say Gary Trent. But in your hearts of hearts, you guys, just, just know, uh, I would have said Alec Burks if it wasn't against the rules. So I'll uh, I'll pass it over to you now for your favorite value play. Yeah, and as I said, I kind of threw the cheat out there with Trent Forrest, but I think you're right in that there is obviously a little bit of worry with how the minutes go. But if, if Jordan Clarkson's ruled out, I feel pretty confident that he'll be able to at least get into that mid-20s again, which gives him a solid base to be able to go. He's shown that he's got a pretty good stroke. Um and I, I like watching Utah. It's one of those teams as well. So I'm, I'm happy to go ahead and take him. But if I'm trying to be a little bit more conservative, I'd say Kaminga is the other one that I'm really targeting. Yep. You cannot go wrong with those guys. I will lean towards the guy that we talked about in the, right in the middle, uh, which would be Javante Green at 4,200. I just think that he's been much more involved all around uh, his all around game. Uh, I get it. We probably want Levine out so he can get a few extra shot attempts, but he's been getting it done. And I mean, the most shot attempts he's had over the past five games has been 10, but it's the steals, it's the blocks, it's the the decent to mediocre boards that he's been getting. And I think best of all, he's got small forward eligibility, which we know is just a tough position to fill out and something that I generally usually spend down at small forward, unless it's a guy like Butler or spending up on somebody else. And on this slate, I've been finding myself spending down just because I don't have the Butler news just yet. So I'll go with Javante Green. And then for your Thrive Fantasy Pick of the Night, I'm not seeing Gary Trent on here. So, I mean, who, who, who knows what you're picking? Yeah, no, it's all it's a bit all over the place. I think it's uh, pretty well priced overall, but I think the one I was gravitating towards was the DeAndre Ayton one and 25 and a half for points, rebounds and assists to be able to get over that for 105 points. I think this is a pretty good spot to be able to do it. Yes, we're still waiting for him to get to that 30 minute marks. But as I said, there hasn't been any indication that he's legitimately on a limit or anything like that. It's just how the game has gone. And I expect him to be a lot more involved in this one. So going to go with that over. I'll go with the Steph Curry under on seven and a half assists. So, you know, saying that he gets seven or less assists. Just think this game's going to get out of hand relatively quickly. Uh, we might not see a full workload, a full minutes load from him. That's an even keel 100 right there for that. So uh, that hour I was leading towards the Donovan Mitchell points, rebounds, assists at 35 and a half. He's going to be playing 32 or 33 minutes because it's a close game. I have very little doubt that he'll be able to do that as well. But that brings us home, my good friend. Uh, now we're going to do our part by asking you guys to subscribe, five star, rate, and review, uh, wherever you listen to this. iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, our radio. I keep saying iTunes. It's Apple. Uh, wherever you might listen to it, though, guys, we really do appreciate it. If you subscribe, you'll get the notification as soon as we post this podcast. So whether it's on your way to work or maybe you listen to us before you go to bed, I, I wouldn't recommend that. I'll probably give you nightmares with my voice, but uh, we do appreciate it. And then if you can give us a follow on Twitter, you can find Harris at H a K underscore devil that is H a K underscore D E V I L. And you can find me at Mike Apatria, M I K E A P O T R I A. Harris, is there anything else you'd like to say before we get on out of here? Uh, no, no, no. It's been a pretty good uh, little bit of a slate. We're getting to the all-star weekend, which I'm super excited about. We get to see the all-star draft coming up on the 10th. Let's see if Team LeBron can once again be a le GM and draft better teams like he always does. It's just super annoying. Where do you think your boy Freddie lies in the three point contest? Yeah, that uh, this is this is where the joke just tells itself. I wish Gary Trent was the one who went into the three point contest here for us, but 
it's almost like it's been a curse. Uh, any of the Raptors that have gone in into the three point contest have just like shat the bed for the rest of the year as far as their shooting is concerned. So I was actually not super happy about him getting in there, but it's just not his kind of shot. He's not the catch and shoot kind of guy. He's more of an off the dribble. So I don't know if he'll do all that well, but we'll see how it goes. Now I'm going to give a throwback name and I, you might have to correct me because I, I could have swore he won it. I know he was in it, but did uh, was the, like the last Raptor that won the three point contest was it Jason Capono? Yeah, Capono won back to back. Yeah, he was yeah. So that was the last Raptor that won it. After that, uh, Lowry went in a few times, did not do very well in that, and yeah, it's just not been uh, it's not been our contest. So let's see if he can break that streak. Not that I expect him to do so, to be honest. And for those who do not know who Jason Capono is, uh, he's basically a poor man's version of Peja Stojakovic. <laughs> um, you know, almost like a Duncan Robinson type role. The dude could make it rain, but no, nonetheless, but didn't have much game outside of that. I think he was only relevant for a few years, but it was, it was very relevant for a few years. But uh, all right, guys. Well, that's it. Thank you guys for tuning in. As always, Santino and DJ Sammy Caps. They'll be back on tomorrow for you guys handling that Tuesday slate. Uh, shoot us a message on Twitter. You can always hit us up on there or join us in our Discord. Uh, that is all. Thank you. Take care. Yeah, let's go take down a tournament.